Growing up in an active LDS family, the plan of salvation has been a concept that has been second nature to me for as long as I can recall. Knowing where I came from, why I'm here on earth, and where I'm going after this life gives me comfort in leading a meaningful life. I've always believed that I am loved by heavenly parents who understand the core makeup of my soul. Although I don't always under fully understand, although I always don't fully understand my path in life, I know that this higher power knows better than I do. My view of the plan of salvation as a gay child of God is unique. I don't necessarily subscribe to the traditional cut and dry LDS definition of this plan. I believe the plan of salvation is more all inclusive of God's children than we might perceive, including his homosexual children. I stand here today to declare my convictions pertaining to the plan of salvation for me in my own life. This is a cherished experience for me because this is the first time of which I am expressing my religious convictions publicly as a gay Latter-day Saint. Just as all members of the LDS Church are given the opportunity to stand before their peers and bear witness of their convictions, I stand here today to, de to declare my beliefs concerning God's all-inclusive plan of salvation. I grew up as a devout Latter-day Saint. During my teenage years, I never veered from the straight and narrow path. I went on a mission at age 19, and I obeyed every mission rule with exactness, with the exception of one can of Pepsi I secretly consumed on New Year's Eve. <laughs> I worked myself to exhaustion on my mission, and I probably burned out a few too many of my missionary companions out of my somewhat obsessive execution of hard work. However, I look back on my mission with very fond memories. Through all of my years growing up, I always knew there was something different about me. What my oddity was, I was not sure. But I knew I was different from my friends. In middle school, my friends started becoming interested in girls, but I didn't. In fact, I became annoyed when my male friends started taking less of an interest in me and more of an interest in the opposite sex. Through high school, my mission, and through college, I was reminded of being different, but I never identified how I was different, nor did I want to. I just wanted to be like everybody else, so I pretended to be just like everybody else. My college years at BYU set in, and this thing that made me different began to wear me down to the point that I knew I had to face my ugly reality. My soul ached as I could not reconcile what I then referred to as my same-sex attraction, or my cross to bear in life or my ultimate test. For, this, for the next six years, I longed to somehow find a way to conform to God's plan of salvation. I believed I had to marry a woman, have children, and raise them up righteously in order to be a part of this plan of salvation. I spent many years in despair, constantly on my knees, pleading with God to change me and help me understand where I fit within this plan of salvation. I eventually concluded that perhaps I could comply with the plan of salvation if I just remained single, celibate, and alone my whole life. After all, many women in the church face this same predicament. Just like with them, perhaps in the next life, the perfect match will be waiting on the other side of the veil. This would therefore make me eligible for the highest degree of the celestial kingdom and gain the blessings of the plan of salvation. There was one problem with this logic, however. To be partnered with a woman physically, emotionally, spiritually, and personally throughout all eternity is not my definition of celestial glory. It is my definition of hell. Since I never chose to be gay, and never having had any ex experiences in life that turned me gay, I could not envision my body or soul being ungay at any future point in time, eternity included. A statement from the pamphlet, God Loveth His Children, reads, As we follow Heavenly Father's plan, our bodies, feelings, and desires will be perfected in the next life so that every one of God's children may find joy in a family consisting of a husband, a wife, and children. I struggle with this statement. As I look back on my life and contemplate the struggle and despair in reconciling my homosexuality, this attitude has been the most damning to my soul through inflicting feelings of inadequacy, anguish, and despair. 
To me, this statement is one from a heterosexual majority to a homosexual minority, affirming that because I am not like most, I must be deformed. For years, I lived under this premonition, accepting that I was, in fact, a spiritual and physical abnormality because of my homosexuality. This statement of mine is a horrible way to live. I cannot express the turmoil that existed inside of me as I lived under this cloud of who you are isn't good enough, but keep looking forward to the resurrection to fix your soul. Not only am I biologically programmed to be homosexual, but also my soul is programmed to be homosexual. Because of this, I do not believe my homosexuality will convert to heterosexuality at my physical death nor at the resurrection. Human-to-human -human interaction to me is complex and fascinating. Like my heterosexual pairs are drawn towards the opposite gender, I am drawn towards my own gender based on the same dimensions of attraction. The magical connection of two souls spiritually, emotionally, personally, and physically. My dreams and intents are just like those of a heterosexual. Companionship, strength, support, intimacy, stability, and eternal growth. My homosexuality, my homosexuality extends far beyond physical attraction. For whatever reasons God saw fit, my soul was created as homosexual. My creation cannot be altered. I believe it's a dangerous game to defy one's own creation. We see time and time again the dangers of fighting one's creation. As we've recently seen with Larry Craig and Ted Haggard, they and their loved ones have been placed in harm's way as a result of defying their creation. I would much rather spend my energy devoting love to a same-sex partner through a responsible, monogamous, and caring relationship than to spend my life making hand signals under bathroom stalls or partaking of methamphetamine with male prostitutes. Elder Jeffrey Holland's recent October Ensign art article entitled Helping Those with Same Gender Attraction states, through the exercise of faith, individual, and individual effort, and reliance upon the power of atonement, some may overcome same, same gender attraction in mortality and marry. Others, however, may never be freed of same gender attraction in this life. I do not consider myself trapped in my orientation in mortality, nor do I anticipate I will be rid of it in the next life. After all, it is a part of the core makeup of my soul. I do not consider my homosexuality to be a personal retardation of which I will be released from at some point in eternity. I'm happy to be just who I am. I have no desire to be freed from myself. I have a few scars on my body. I have a large nose. My hairline is receding. I get frequent headaches and my teeth aren't as wide as I'd like them to be. Perhaps many of my perceived physical abnormalities will be fixed through the resurrection. I welcome these changes as well as other changes that might bring my physical body to its full potential. The view of my soul, however, is different. I love my soul and I love who I am. I do not want my soul to be altered in any form as I believe the makeup of my soul is how God intended it to be. To imply that my soul will be resurrected based on the premise of my sexual orientation is hurtful to me. Because there is little known about the progression of a homosexual child of God, I've had to forge my own understanding of what God's plan is for me in this life. Many of, the questions remain, many of my questions remain unanswered, but I found special meaning in the words of Moroni. O oh, then despise not and wonder not, but hearken unto the words of the Lord, and ask the Father in the name of Jesus, for what brings soever ye shall need, stand in need. Doubt not, but be believing, and begin as in times of old, and come unto the Lord with all your heart, and work out your own salvation with fear and trembling before him. I believe the plan of salvation includes the eternal progression of a homosexual as a homosexual. Moses, teaches, Moses teaching Joshua, as cited in the Book of Mormon, teaches me a powerful principle in my search for answers to the plan of salvation in my own life. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake. Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. 
As Moses explains, we must become prophets unto ourselves and navigate our path in life according to the will of God. I don't have the luxury of my LDS peers of a clearly defined plan of salvation for my life. However, I believe I was a homosexual in the pre-existence. I am clearly a homosexual in mortality, and I strongly believe I will be a homosexual in the next life. With this said, few reasonable alternatives are offered to me by the LDS Church as to how to lead a happy life. I know that a life of solitude, silence, and false hope for change is not my plan of happiness. To sit in the corner in silence about whom I am, hoping for a change that will not occur, while looking forward to living and dying alone, hoping to be transformed into a person who I am not, is not what I would consider happiness. Since I believe I am eternally homosexual, celibacy and mortality seems pointless for me eternally. God wants me to be happy. I also believe he created me uh, as who I am for a reason. I no longer believe I will face damnation for finding and loving a soulmate in this life. And just as my heterosexual peers have the privilege to live with their eternal soulmate throughout the eternities, I also believe I will not be denied that same privilege. I recognize that my beliefs pertaining to homosexuality deviate from the church's approach. In years past, I thought this disconnect would haunt me for life. Some say that my beliefs on the eternal nature of my homosexuality indicate that I've been misled. I recall one of my favorite Bible passages from the book of Matthew, where Jesus states, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. The fruits I've seen to, that I've seen come to pass in my life by the acceptance of the eternal nature of my soul have been astoundingly positive. I found new fulfillment and peace that I never knew was possible. Amazing changes have occurred in my life as I've come to accept myself for whom God created me to be. I'm no longer fighting internal, grueling internal battles. Heavy burdens have been lifted, of which I used to carry day and night. I feel free. I used to be hopeless, and now I am hopeful. I wake up with a smile on my face, eager to face the challenges of each day. I enjoy a better quality of life. I feel more resolute spiritually and emotionally. My friendships are more abundant and have greater depth and understanding. My work, out, my work ethic and my focus on life's goals have intensified. I treat people with more kindness than I used to. I'm optimistic about my personal challenges. My family relationships have become more honest. And as is evident today, I've developed a stronger, more loyal relationship with my brother. I laugh a lot more. I see endless possibilities ahead of me. Each day seems to be better than the day before. I live the gospel more realistically than I have before. The saving power of Christ's grace has become an empowering force in my daily life. I have a clear understanding of what it means to be a Christian. I found a new love of the two great commandments of loving God and loving one's neighbor, no exceptions. Best of all, my soul no longer aches. This self-legitimacy has been one of the greatest gifts that I have ever given myself. As explained by Christ in the previous Bible passage, these fruits are virtuous, and I am thereby led to believe I am pursuing a life that is right for me, including the complete acceptance of my homosexuality. If I were misled, there is no possible way I could experience such godly changes in my life. Some might argue that my beliefs in my eternal nature are not doctrinally sound. Often the Old Testament's Levitical co code is used as harsh ammunition to subjugate any f open form of dialogue around homosexuality. If we truly remain consistent with the Old Testament's rejection of homosexuality, then we must also legalize polygamy, encourage concubinage, legalize prostitution, prohibit intertribal and interracial marriage, ban all forms of birth control, 
strip women of their civil rights, and marry off our 13-year-old daughters. Clearly, our adherence to the Levitical Code is inconsistent. Additionally, as Latter-day Saints, we believe the Book of Mormon to be the truest book on the face of the earth, to act as a compass to us in the last days. Yet the Book of Mormon is amazingly silent on the subject of homosexuality. The Doctrine and Covenants, meant to be a specific guide to us in the Latter-day era of the Gospel, is also completely silent on the matter. Joseph Smith, inspired by James, read, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Just like the prophet Joseph, I've experienced confusion as to my place in the kingdom of God and where I fit into God's plan. Piece by piece, I've received answers from my Creator, which has given me more and more clarity with each passing day. I doubt I will ever have all the answers to my questions surrounding my orientation, but I believe I will continue to receive answers day by day to help me find more happiness with each passing day. I've never been happier knowing that I indeed have a place in the plan of salvation as a legitimate homosexual. God created me this way, and despite societal rejection of my claim, I know that He is happy with who I am. I don't have all the answers, but I strongly believe that I have a place in the kingdom of God as a gay child of God. Having this peace of mind makes fighting any of today's external battles easy. At last, I am happy and resolved before God with who I am. It's nice to be with you today. I am here today solely to support my brother Clark. My response to my brother Clark is, I love you and I support you. Now that you are open about being gay, you are reconsidering life's paths, some of which remain in the church while others lead well beyond what you have known for most of your life. Whichever path you choose, whether in the church or not, my hope is that you will always honestly seek truth and continue to pursue opportunities to become a better person, a more enlightened, knowledgeable, tolerant, loving, and spiritual person, so that you will continue to experience the joy that this life was intended to offer. Your revelation today requires courage, and it reflects a trust in and regard for the Sunstone community as a place of openness and diversity. This panel is an important step for you in coming to terms with your identity and will allow you to peacefully move on and lead a productive life. In June 2006, when Clark formally announced that he was gay in a letter sent to family members, my heart sank, not because of who Clark truly was, but because of the agony that he suffered. Uh, over the previous six years as he painfully sought out ecclesiastical and church-approved professional counseling while trying to reconcile his identity with everything he had ever been taught as a lifelong devoted church member. I recall a particularly poignant and heartfelt portion of this letter which he has permitted me to share. Quote, <clears throat> it has taken me 30 years final to finally make such a formal declaration. Those words mark the beginning of a long and difficult process of how those in my life will reconcile the fact that I am a homosexual. I wish I could deny that I am gay. I would give everything I have to make such an admission be untrue. I am now classified negatively by the world, condemned by society, and denigrated by my church. But I can no longer live a lie, despite the scorn I will face as an admitted homosexual. I did not choose to be this way. I cannot alter my creation." Close quote. As a brother, I felt ashamed that I had not been the kind of confidant that Clark could have trusted during these forlorn years of pain and anguish. I am saddened that he had to endure his suffering in solitude and silence. While he has since assured me during this time he was incapable of admitting the inevitable to himself, much less to others, I remain troubled that my own brother fought his demons without the loving support of family. I am not ashamed of my brother being a gay man. Clark has always been a wonderful brother to me, and while our interests and personalities differ in many ways, supporting my brother as he comes to terms with who he is and what ultimately makes him happy has been a bonding experience that has most certainly drawn us closer together. 
Ironically, his recent revelation has been the foundation upon which we are building a significantly stronger brotherly relationship. For many years, Clark and I have been unable to connect. Ours was a primarily perfunctory relationship, but one that did not require significant commitments of time, energy, or emotion. For many of those years, I sensed that something was wrong, was gnawing at Clark, something that made him feel uneasy and occasionally hostile toward the church, something that caused him to distance himself from family and church, something that made him seem almost unreachable. I knew an internal struggle was brewing within his soul, but I was not entirely certain of the source of his grief, though I had some inkling. For most people that knew and grew up with Clark in the church, I am certain that this disclosure will come as quite a, quite a surprise to them. While I do not feel it appropriate, nor do I feel qualified to delve into a comprehensive psychosexual analysis of Clark's past, I will say very generally that I was not surprised to learn of Clark's same gender attraction. I've considered the possibility for many years, not so much from the information he has shared in the past, but more from the information he has not shared. I am convinced more than ever that Clark did not consciously choose his homosexuality any, any more than I chose my heterosexuality. Today, Clark knows that I love him for who he is, not in spite of who he is. Our differences have been the bonding ingredient for our strengthening relationship, one which I hope will continue to flourish throughout the eternities. I am grateful that we are growing closer together as brothers, and my greatest wish for him is to find happiness and joy in this life, even if it takes him away from the church, though selfishly I hope that he can find a way to stay and partake of all the goodness that exists in the church. The church needs strong individuals like Clark. While I am no scientist, I can say without reservation that based on over 30 years of personal observation and interaction with Clark, he and I simply possess different genetic wiring. There is no repressed childhood, no absent fatherly figure, or none of the other damaging aspects of childhood traditionally associated with homosexuality. I also know that Clark's commitment to the church, both before and after his mission would obviate any chance of his choosing this orientation, given the very real, significant stigma associated with same-sex attraction in the church and in much of society. <coughs> I have mixed emotions when I read the latest church attempt to explain its view on same-gender attraction entitled, God Loveth His Children. I also read Jeffrey Holland's article, Helping Those Who Struggle With Same-Gender Attraction in the October End Sign. Finally, I, can, I contrasted these more recent church statements with those expressed by Dallin Oaks in 1996 in an article entitled Same Gender Attraction. On one hand, the church has clearly distanced itself from previous positions of homosexuality not being a condition, but rather being a complex set of thoughts, feelings, or behaviors. While the difference may seem nuanced, the church seems more open to accepting same-sex attraction as a genetic condition into which somebody is born. Put another way, the church more willingly concedes that there are gay members of the church whose feelings are very real and very strong, and that such feelings can naturally stem from genetic code. Another subtle shift seems to be the church's de-emphasis of homoerotic thoughts as sinful, choosing to concentrate squarely on homosexual behavior instead. Finally, the church appears less eager to exact church discipline on those homosexuals who continue their church membership without maintaining celibacy. In short, the church has made strides in softening their, pro their approach to discussing same-sex gender attraction in that it uses less strident verbiage. It concedes that such feelings can be inborn and therefore natural and real. And it admits that there is much we do not know about the hows and whys of somebody being born homosexual. Having said all this, the church has very clearly maintained its stance about the behavior it expects from its gay members. The approach to addressing same-sex attraction has softened while its doctrine remains unchanged. And in stark contrast to its newly professed ignorance as to why people are born homosexual here on earth, the church continues to eliminate the possibility of its existence in both the pre-mortal and post-mortal spheres. Unfortunately for many gay church members, such exclusion makes it difficult for them to maintain a place among the fold because their very being or identity does not figure into pre-mortal or post-mortal plans. 
Not surprisingly, many of them pursue paths of happiness outside the church. Consider some of the descriptors of homosexuality in the church's most recent publication, God Loveth His Children. Quote, as we follow Heavenly Father's plan, our bodies, feelings, and desires will be perfected in the next life so that every one of God's children may find joy in a family consisting of a husband, wife, and children. Quote, base your decisions on eternal principles rather than on earthly challenges or desires. Quote, the desire for physical gratification does not authorize immor Im immorality by anyone. Quote, if we fill our lives with the spiritual nourishment God has provided, we can more easily gain control over inclinations and become masters of ourselves. Quote, do not blame anyone for problems not fully understood in this life. The church's message seems to be that homosexuality is an earthly affliction or problem that has no place in the next life, but that God will make such individuals whole. In the meantime, stay true to the principles of the church and trust that God will make everything right eventually. While not trying to give rationale to gay members thinking of leaving the church, if I were in their shoes, this would be a very difficult pill for me to swallow on so many fronts. To add insult to injury, the article suggests that physical gratification is a core driver of homosexual behavior. When I think of my own heterosexuality, I, like many of you, don't view relationships and marriage through a lens of physical gratification. Rather, pursuing and finding a loving and committed relationship was all about aspiring for an ideal that would bring greater joy and meaning to life. While physical intimacy is a natural extension of loving relationships, most gay individuals I know seek and desire loving relationships in the same way that most of us do, where physical, where physical gratification is not the main driving force. So as for where I stand on how homosexuality fits or doesn't fit into the church's eternal plan, I honestly don't know. I suppose I'll have a more processed answer in a few more years once I take more time to consider the possibilities. I know the ch church's view of eternity, but I also know that there is much about the hereafter that has never been revealed. So for now, what I can say is that I believe in an om omnipotent God who loves all of his children and knows all things related to this issue. And I know that he loves Clark very much and is proud of the life that Clark is leading. I, like Clark, anxiously look forward to learning more of his will concerning this issue in the next life. As church members, we can be more loving and tolerant of those who are different from us. I am heartened to hear church leaders castigate its members for failing to love, accept, and fellowship those who are different from the mainstream. In his October Ensign article entitled, Helping Those Who Struggle with Same Gender Attraction, Jeffrey Holland states that, quote, when our actions and words discourage someone from taking full advantage of church membership, we fail them and the Lord. The church is made stronger as we include every member and strengthen one another in service and love. To this I add my unequivocal voice of agreement and my hope that we can all be more open and loving to members of the church from all walks of life. Thank you.